All right. So personal connections. This is kind of it's kind of the opposite of what I was talking about before, where it's you're taking a student and putting them into the situation that you're learning about, maybe putting them into the novel that you're reading, maybe putting them into that historical time period and trying to get them to engage with the material in that way. This is kind of flipping that and trying to take whatever the material you're doing and bringing it into the student's life, trying to make it applicable to their life. So whatever it is that you're learning about, oh, can you go back real quick? Yeah. So whatever it is that you're learning about, it's trying to figure out a way that in some small way can make it connect to their life somehow. So when I was worried there'd be math people in here, I was trying to think about how you could do this in math, and I was thinking like, if you're doing geometry, say, okay, think about your bedroom at home, and then do some basic ge geometric stuff. And that's a real simple thing where a kid's like, oh, I'm thinking about my bedroom, that's a real quick, easy, personal connection. It's not anything complicated, it's not anything crazy, it's just real quick. One example that we do in our world geography class is the very first day of class, we give them a homework assignment to go home, ask their parents what country their family immigrated here from, find out a little bit about that country, the culture, and think about whether or not any of that culture still is applicable in their life, right? Second day of class, you can see Andrew has his map back here and it's projected up here also. We spend probably about half the class period and it's a big chunk of time and we call the kids up one by one and we give them a sticker and they put a sticker on the map of the country they're from. They say what the country is. They say a little bit about um, when their family came, the time period, how it still impacts their life. And at the very beginning of a world geography class, you have the kids have some level of buy-in of, look, every single person here is originally from somewhere else. Why do we care about world geography? Why do we learn? Because we live in a country where, unless you're Native American, everybody came from somewhere else. And look, we have a visual representation of that. But on top of that, it helps us kind of develop a classroom community, too, because the kids are learning a little bit more about each other. Right? Also, it helps me remember their names on the second day of class, know a little bit more about them, tell them that they're from Italy. I like to know, I don't give them extra credit if they bring it in. Right? That kind of stuff. And then I also have a lot of follow-up questions. Like, and I was super surprised. Both of us had a ton of kids from Italy. Yeah. Maybe there's a huge, strong... Or can trace their heritage. Because right, right, right. Yeah, can trace their heritage. Maybe there's a strong Italian population, the Italian population in San Ramon. I didn't know, but now I know that, right? But it's just these kind of, this kind of a thing where a kid... As we go through class, when we learn about Asia, we can point to the map. When we learn about Africa, we can, I mean, I didn't actually have anybody from Africa, but we can point to the map. When we learn about well, different, different parts, we can point to that map and continually kind of reinforce to them, this is how what we're learning is relevant in your life. Because it's us, right? This is the story of us. This is where we came from. And like I said, it helps develop that, that sense of community right at the very beginning. But there's all kinds of different ways to do this. This is just how we do it in our class. I used to do a thing where, um, and I learned this from like a professional development day, where it was like I had the kids fill out a note card when they came in the class, right? And so a lot of people do this. You can tell your name, what you like to be called, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, write down something about yourself that you think you have in common with everybody in class. Write down something about yourself you think you have in common with some of the people in class. And write down something about yourself that makes you unique. And maybe you guys are familiar with this kind of like an icebreaker. And so then I take a, one of the, the cards, and I don't say who it is, and I read the first thing. I'm a Giants fan. Or I go to all right. <laughs> or I go to California high school and everybody stands up. Then I read the next thing. If it's true about you, everybody's standing. I'm a Giants fan. And have the kids sit down because half of them are AIDS fan. And the third thing I, I read is, you know, something that's unique to that kid and everybody else sits down. And everybody's like, oh, it was you the whole time, right? And you go through that with a bunch of the different kids and they learn interesting, unique things about each other. Helps develop a sense of community in the classroom. This one doesn't necessarily help them connect to the content as much, but it's more of a kind of community building thing. And I think the kids have a lot more buy-in in the class when they feel like, I know stuff about other people in the class. I know stuff about Mr. Bristol. Mr. Bristol knows stuff about me. And I can always go back and be like, hey man, I know that you're a Harry Potter fan. And that, you know, whatever it is, you know, what, just small things like that. It helps you connect with those kids. And it takes up a lot of time. Like this took up like half of the class. I had the kids come up one by one, put the sticker up there, talk about what I had them come up in groups. Oh, okay, it took him a lot less time. It took me like <laughs> half a class, and then I don't know what But I, think, I really think it's worth the time, because it's developing this as a community, and in this case, it's a direct connection as to, it's part of my first day, second day, why the hell do we care about world geography? Why do we care about the culture? You have to answer that. Or, yeah. yeah, because it's our culture. It's our geography, right? And that's, it, it, it buys that connection. And so there's a lot of different ways to do it. And um, this is the way that we chose to do it. And I, I, despite the amount of time that it takes, and there's shortcuts, 
um, I think it's important to do because developing this as a community and, and giving that connection between the content and why it affects their individual lives, like why they care about it, right? I don't know if you guys saw my lyrical life lesson when you walked in today, uh, but since we were talking about student engagement, I thought I'd quote some Nirvana. Um, here we are now entertaining, so you doesn't seem to you know, tie in that, but that's what I like to do. I love music. You can see by my mosaic that I have in the back there. It's a great conversation starter for parents first, but also students, because, you know, hipsters, they're bringing back vinyl. It's true. So you older teachers, you can talk vinyl with the students, and they'll know what is going on there. But I figured that I've always done something like this because I like music. You know, I would write bands that I'm listening to, and then I'd have good conversation just like that. Oh, you like them? What about this? But since I'm teaching freshmen this year, and I have, I've not taught fresh, freshmen before, it's usually seniors, I thought, well, what if I can kind of turn them into life lessons? And so what I do is I take lyrics, and I alter them, the meaning of them, by where I cut it off. And so, you know, like, lyrical life lesson test days don't speak. So, like, that's the message that I'm giving to it. That is a lyrics directly from the song, but it's not the content. You know, it's a heartbreaking song about when Safani breaking up with the same guy over and over again. Um, <laughs> dating, you know, I, I try to, whatever I'm listening to, I'm trying to find those lyrics so that I can use it at a different time. And I also try to go across the, gen, the genres. Like, I put most deaf up. One time, my kid's like, you listen to rap? I like, yeah, I like some hip-hop. Let's talk about that. So country, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I'll mention this one as well, because I just did this the other time as well. Whenever I can play music in the class, I like to do that. Um, we're talking about American culture, because we're in the first unit. And the other day, my lyrical life lesson was from, you want to be Americano? Um, which is a song that's been covered multiple times, but while they were drawing a picture of an American or what they perceive an American to be or what is American culture, I had the music going in the background for the exact song in the English and the Italian version, which is clearly better if you guys have seen it from uh, the talented Mr. Ripley, you know what I'm talking about. So I played both versions of those songs, and it's interesting that a lot of the illustrations that they did, they picked up on the descriptions of the song in their drawings in that. So I do that there. When we're talking about Asia, and I have them free write about karma. What is karma and what is it? And I play them some Justin Timberlake, uh, Timberlake in this song. And then we make the connection about you know, Britney Spears cheating on him and how she got what was coming to her at a different time. So again, maybe it's dated. They love it though, at least the freshman girls. And they love it. They love when you play music and you attempt to make that connection to them, even if you fail, okay? They love the attempt to try to mix it up and try to make it different. My philosophy in teaching is, especially with the standardization movement, right, we could, do the same thing every day, but we should be more like chefs in that we're required to produce certain things, but we have the freedom on what it looks like and how we mix it up and how we put it together. And so I also think if I'm bored, I know they're bored. And I get bored pretty easy. Not that we have to dance every day or whatever, but if you're in there for two hours and you're bored, think of a different way or what else you can do to mix up that. Well, one thing I would add to this is that uh, and I were talking about is he loves music, right? So his thing is music. You might be like, I don't know. It doesn't have to be music, right? It's whatever your thing is. I mean, and this is a super detailed, in-depth way of looking at it. But you know, you know this. You've taught it. As soon as you say I'm a Giants fan, half the kids in the class love you. But I love the Giants too, right? It's this is something that develops a personal connection between you and the kids. And so he takes it to another level for sure. And you, your music might not be your thing, it could be something else, but anything your thing is, guaranteed, some of the kids in the class also have that thing, and it helps you develop that connection, right? So maybe lyrical life lessons isn't your thing, but it's something else that you can infuse into your class, too, right? Yeah, that's not how it works. Okay, participation. Um, so I'm going to talk about Corso Cash Bucks. I'm just, I'm not, I'm just recording stuff. Well, I mean, actually, uh, Shannon and I had a really good conversation about uh, participation the other day. 
And part of the thing for me with participation is I've tried it a few different ways and I feel like I always fail at it. It's really hard to do. Because I feel like it works as far as getting the kids to like raise their hands. They're like, sweet, I'm going to get points, I'm going to get points, I'm going to get points. But the way that I did it, I had like a seating chart and I always had to go back and mark it. And I was walking, trying to get into the class and talk to the kids. And they're like, if you got to give me a point. I'm like running over here, giving them a point and all this other stuff. And I just felt like it got them to raise their hands. It got them to participate because they wanted those points. Because, you know, the high school kids in Santa Monica, they just eat up points like crazy. But it just, like the way I was doing it at my old school was totally inefficient, ineffective. And so I was talking to Corso, and he's telling me the way that he does it, and it's kind of similar to the way that Shanna and Anya do it, um, although there's some differences. And, I, and I, I kind of think I honed in on the reason that it's successful. And so what he does is, oh, nice. He has these Corso cash bucks, which has a picture of his beautiful baby, I assume, or he put somebody else's baby on there, which is really <laughs> weird, but I assume it's his baby. And he has them in his pocket, and as he's teaching, walking around the class, a kid does something, says something cool, he drops off a course of, course of cash buck to him, blah, 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 and gives it to them. And to me, that was the difference of success. Well, let me, let me actually finish what, what happens. Then at the end of every unit, the kids come and turn in the course of, course of cash bucks, right? And I think what he does, he starts at like, for the unit, you have an 80 out of 100 on participation, right? And each cash buck is worth two points or whatever. So you come and cash those in, and that gets you closer to the 100. Right? And I think it's similar, I think, to what Shannon does, because Shannon does stickers and she gives them to the kids as they do things that are awesome too. And I think the thing that makes it more effective is putting the onus on the kids to keep track of their participation. Rather than you having to like have some spreadsheet or do something or have some keep track of it in some way. I feel like for me personally, I just couldn't focus on that. Because when I teach, I'm literally I'm I'm all over the place, right? Like I this is when me and Andrew put this together, he forced me to be way more organized than I usually am. Because I'm usually just like, ah, I'm talking about stuff, whatever. So for me to like have, for me to have like an organized thing, it just wasn't working. I think giving the kids the, the cash bucks, giving the kids the sticker, they have to keep that and then they bring it to you and show it to you at the end of the unit. Then you don't have to keep track of it until just that one moment. And I think that made it more effective. For me, I think keeping track of participation and giving points, I like that because I've noticed that it, the kids care. They stay engaged. They stay wanting to know what's going on. Even if it's just for the point, they're still engaged in what's happening in class, right? But I just couldn't be efficient in keeping track. And I think the way that Corso does it with the cash bucks, or the way that Shannon or Ani do it with their stickers, by giving the students the thing and then having them come in and then translating that to points at the end of the unit makes it much more effective than kind of you having to keep track of it yourself, which didn't work for me. But it does work for Andrews in the way that he does it which is more connected to the things. Yeah, interestingly enough, there's another teacher my old school, Mr. Coyne, who did the same thing. And there was a huge illegal black market for bonus bucks, as he called it. So, I mean, there are pluses and minuses to all that. No, literally, like, yeah, people are paying people yeah. for those bonus bucks to make it happen because he made the class so difficult and so on and so forth. So, with any of this stuff, obviously, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, um, that's fine. And, I mean, when I developed this, that's what I was thinking about. And for me, I can't keep track of everything either. I just try to keep track of the big things, like tardy. So if a student is tardy and they walk in, they sit down in their seat, I'm just gonna come over here and mark off one of the points that they have off here. But the thing is, it's about group dynamics, so it doesn't just impact them, it impacts the group in itself. And I know what you guys are thinking, wait a second, that's not fair. Well, it doesn't go into their grade as a whole, it would only go in positively. How that looks like is depending on you and your comfort level, which is uh, the winning groups maybe getting to make up assignments or you know what level of extra credit or whatever. For me, the philosophy is with a lot of participation points, oftentimes it's giving 10% you know, to a lot of the kids in that situation. So I'm more okay with manipulating with like smaller percentages and allowing to do that. But I have a lot of buy-in because students know the negatives, like if they're on their cell phones, I don't get into long, big discussions about them. I look over and I'm like, how's it going? I send the message, take a point off, and move on from there. And if still they don't put it away or whatever, then that's where I have to take more in-depth um, actions about it. But usually that is not the case. But it's also positive. 
I have whiteboards that are also color coordinated, of course, right? And I'll have questions as open. I say, okay, get your whiteboards out and then list as many countries in this region as you can. And they're competing against each other and they're working together depending on how they score. And that will positively go into their grade. I just had a review game, which I'm going to talk about later in here today. And that's why there are 22 points in fifth period from group 11. That's not 22 participation points or bonus points or whatever, it's just the winning groups, but um, I always make it so that there's a game at the end, a review thing where if you're one of the last place teams, you have a chance to get back in, because if so, then I don't want to alienate or stop those kids from trying uh, to, be, to be involved in it. I initially got this from an AP teacher when I was first student teaching, and she had a, a push class, and what she did is instead of the colors, with, which I've done, she did like early America, so like loyalists and Tories and whatever, and so gave the names to each of the groups, and they changed those names for units, and the, so they had ownership of that. And you could do it for like, okay, do the Tories, you have your homework, all the good, check, great, point, or you know, however you want to do it. It works for me. I've done it in AP. I've done it freshmen. I've done it juniors and sophomores. But obviously, you know, with all of this, whatever you're comfortable with or you're interested in, that is what you should do. Okay, let me talk about four corners. And I'll stop for a second and just tell you that um, we wanted to do things that were not trending right now at this district. You know what I'm talking about? It seems like with a lot of the... Um, the training and stuff like that, we we're talking a lot about Socratic seminars and then uh, other stuff like that. So we wanted to purposely try and bring other stuff on that so that it's not exactly the same. At one point, I'm sure that Four Corners was trending, if you could focus in on it. I love doing this. I've done it for World Geo. One more. This is for um, a government class that I taught. And I just had the idea this year to include the direction in the slide itself. I used to print out a big agree, a disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree. What I love about this activity is people have to physically get up and stand and move to what their opinion is. So 100% of the class is engaged just by movement to what their opinion is. And you have to have really good questions. Like the the freedom to worship applies to all groups regardless of how extreme. Okay, what does that mean? What about this group? If they can say, what about this group, then they're going to go back and forth. Or even someone makes a good idea, yeah, that's right, you know? Maybe I'm not as strongly in agreement as I was before. I'm going to stand over here. What I always do after I post something up like this, I'll start with a group that is the smallest and say, okay, tell me why you're standing alone or why you guys think this. I play the devil's advocate and I lead and drive the discussion from there. And man, the richness and the engagement that I've had in regular Gov and AP Gov in asking questions like this um, is pretty intense. And they come up with great examples and they persuade each other. It's just a great way to have a discussion instead of just throwing it out to the class. So what do you think about, I mean, if you just ask this as a teacher, you'll get the try hard, right? or another person to raise their hand and answer the question. But when you see everyone have to move, it's a much different dynamic. Just to add a couple things, because we, we did this in World Geo, and one of the things I noticed is that, one, you do have some kids that usually wouldn't raise their hand participate more. And I don't know if it's just being up on their feet makes them more inclined to participate, or the fact that they're standing with a large herd of their friends next to them gives them more confidence to say what they believe. But there are some kids that don't normally talk that did talk. The other thing too is, sometimes it gets into a back and forth, so we in instituted a, a rule at one point which was, you can't say anything until three other people have said something in yep. your group, right? Because we don't want just one kid to be like, oh, I totally agree, I'm gonna go on, because I know a lot about the subject, and other people are like, I don't really but know. You call on different right? kids, too, different questions, or right. try to mix it up. But then also, calling on kids that aren't raising their hand, too, because one of the things that does happen is like, hey, all my friends are going to that corner, so I'm just gonna go stand in that corner. So you'd be like, hey, Joe, why are you standing in that corner? And then they have to say something, right? They have to, they have to justify why they're standing in that corner. 
And if they don't really have a reason, sometimes once they really think about it, like, I guess I actually belong over here once you ask them a couple questions. And just quickly, this is where they would stand. So strongly agree, agree, disagree in that corner, and strongly disagree. Dude, we're going to run out of time, so let's just, we want to try to get them out early a little bit. Okay. Uh, debate bracket. This is something that my gov the gov teacher at my old school did, and it was pretty awesome. Basically, at the end of um, at the end of I don't know what he did. I think towards the end of the class, he basically assigned each kid one of the presidents, and they you're right. Yeah. Uh, they assigned each kid one of the presidents. The kid had to do a whole bunch of research, and they basically did a debate style thing where they each had to debate each other. They each got like two minutes or something like that and say, this is why William Henry Harrison was the best president we ever had, and this is why George Washington was the best president we ever had. Now, obviously, some of the kids have a built-in advantage because the George Washington kids should beat the William Henry Harrison kid, right? Unless that kid really sucks and this kid's really great. And that happens sometimes. But if you win, you move on to the next round. And you keep moving on every time you move on. I think he did this for extra credit or something. Every time you move on, you give more and more extra credit. So you had an incentive to keep going and moving on. But each time you moved on, you couldn't reuse or recycle the arguments from before. So you had to keep coming up with new arguments as to why your president was the best. Now, <coughs> the presidents works really well in the government class, but you could do this any number of ways. Like in US history class, you could cha change out the presidents for best inventions, or best concepts, or best movements, or just best Americans that weren't presidents, right? Or in a literature class, periodic table. Well, yeah, elements. For sure. And I'll, uh, yeah, if you, I don't know anything about science, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Literally, my best. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, in literature class, if you do it all the way at the end, maybe you could just pick a bunch of different characters from a bunch of different novels. And who was the most evil, who was the, the most great, who had the biggest impact on the novel, and the kids would have to take these characters and defend it. And you're talking about a bunch of different novels, right? Or in American history, you're talking about a bunch of different time periods, but the kids are having to stand up and debate it, and I'm telling you, the kids, some of the, I had some kids come back to me, I was a US history teacher who didn't care anything about what I was saying, and they were like, tell me all about Grover Cleveland, and I was like, dude, you're not gonna win, I'm sorry, like, you're not gonna win Grover Cleveland, but I know that's your favorite, no, no. Uh, that's your favorite, but you know what I mean? So they were coming back and they were engaged, they were wanting to give the information, they were super stoked on it, and I think the key to this is that it's competitive. God, kids love being competitive with each other, right? They love being competitive. And so if they can compete with one another and beat each other and brag about it and everybody talking about it, I think that this is something that can be used in a variety of different ways. The way I've seen it is with the presidents, but I think you could exchange a whole bunch of different things in there. Um, and the kids have the opportunity to be competitive, and um, it takes a lot of time. So AP hey, teachers, I've seen it for AP Gov, uh, terms that are going to be in the AP exam. And so they have to yeah, argue yeah. for a justification of, oh, this one is better because it's found in both, it's found in political parties and whatever. And so I've seen that with this type of concept. Don't have to be easy to do that for your own time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, quickly, rule of three. I'm very proud of this. I don't know how many of you guys do Jeopardy in your class, but as history teachers, that's like a typical thing. Like, all right, let's play Jeopardy. That's the ultimate review that you do. If you do, it's cool. I'm not. Hating on Jeopardy. Anyway, I will say that I've changed the way that I do Jeopardy because I've found over the years that, again, it's very hard to get the entire class engaged in Jeopardy. You get, even if you do it in groups like this, at maximum there'd be 12 people at one time participating going for that one point. And so what I did is I created a game that I call Rule of Three. And it is based upon this seating arrangement as well. What I love about this game is that I will project you can advance forward. Okay. I'll project up um, an image like this, like we're getting ready to do our introduction test and part of it is longitude and latitude. And they're only competing against the group that they're sitting in. They can sit wherever they want. And so there's a lot more buying and ownership and everyone is doing it because they're only competing against those three people. But all groups are going at the same time. And what also is nice about it is depending on who wins and gets the most points, they advance forward a number in the next round. Whoever loses, they advance backwards, and whoever's in the middle, they stay. And so every single round, everyone is competing against different groups. And kids who, uh, my favorite experience is watching some kids look in shock, like, I beat this person? Or, wait, I know more than I think that I do about this? You really see a lot of ahas because it's not just Again, the three or four people who always win at Jeopardy up here winning to get the points, every single person is involved in trying to make this happen. And you can take the same questions from Jeopardy 
and turn them into a slide based on the organization like I do. We just did this to, today and it worked very well. So, look at, yeah. So then you just have blank ones and then I'll say trade and grade, click. They'll see what the answer is. And they're silent too. It's nice. Sometimes, you know, one of the worries about student engagement is you give them too much voice or power, then they're gonna go crazy. But there can be activities where you're like, no, you're silent for this amount, then you get to talk. And so on and so forth. You forgot if you talk about how they move up and move back? Yeah. Oh you did not that. Okay. Yeah, so if they win, they move forward, and they lose, they move backwards. That's it. There's always ties though. So in the first round, rock, paper, scissors, other than that, total score. Okay, this is an idea that I heard about before, but of course it was telling me about, and um, you want to do yours, and then if we have time, we'll do this one? Sound sounded wanna... that hard, huh? <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, like, I want to run out of time and not have you think. Like, Speaking about you're... silent mingle, or being silent, again, sometimes a review, I'd like to do different types of review, because even if I do Jeopardy every time, with repetition, when you can mix it up, I think there's more interest that is generated. And so this is a thing that I do for my econ class. Uh, so it's found, uh, you just make it on any traditional like bingo board or whatever. And sometimes when it's a unit that's very important and you want them to have a study guide afterwards, I'll create and generate the questions and put it inside of it. And everyone will sign their name on it and then it's completely silent and they have to get up and move around and sign what they believe are the answers and rotate it with others. And so, I mean, it's, it's not groundbreaking or anything, but I'll tell you what, this is another activity where it's my belief that if they can't see it or write it down, they don't know it. Prove it. Okay, we're getting ready to take a test. You don't know the answer. Uh, one problem with this though is there are a lot of kids who don't know the answer, so they like sign the wrong answer. So you have to have it built in where I typically post the correct answers online after my classes have taken it um, so that they're able to check that and they have a study guide ready to go for that. Again, you can do this as a small, quick activity to check for understanding or like bingo or something, or you could do blackout. And it's just another alternative to Jeopardy where you, you're testing and getting to see uh, if they know this concept. I think the cool thing about this and some of the other things is like getting kids up and about. Right? Yeah. In a hundred minute They're class moving. period, I mean, you guys look like you're about to fall asleep. I wish we had seen these in action. Up. I would have loved to have seen some of these done. Because yeah. I can't visualize it. I need to participate. Right, right, okay. right, right. Yeah, so uh, that was part of the irony of... Okay. Okay. Like, yeah, we're student engagement, now we're just going to talk at you. Yeah. For Everything we've been doing is the exact opposite of what we're talking about. Yeah, right. But it's true. Just getting so you kids, know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. No believers. Getting kids up and out of their seats, I think, in a 100-minute period is, is, is crucial. Um, and that this one, I could do it.